My name is Manish Jain. I live in Rajasthan, India, and I um, work with a people's movement there called Shikshantar. And our work is on um, restoring uh, and regenerating uh, different spaces of learning, different kinds of knowledge systems, different kinds of ways of uh, holistic living in India. And maybe I'll just start with some things which are on my mind, where we've seen it on our, at the level of our community, where different kinds of funding has um, played an impact or distorted different kinds of relationships. Um, so one is like in India we have um, <coughs> tradition when um, there, are, there are guests um, for something like a wedding or some kind of gathering. Um, what would happen is people would open up their homes. So if I was having a gathering, people coming from around India for my, for my event, I would ask different friends, can you open up your home and people could stay with you. Um, so it was a wave of kind of um, saving money but also interweaving community. Um, people would stay there for two, three, four days and um, they would, um, you know, be able to build relationships. So we actually drew from that principle and when we started having visitors from abroad from all over India as well, come to Udaipur, we'd ask them, can you stay with, you know, I'd, we'd ask friends, can they stay with you, kind of a, it's an old version of couch surfing, right? Um, and what happened is when there's different kind of donors started coming into our community, um, they started paying people to stay at their houses. So this whole kind of relationship and thought around hospitality shifted radically. Where then people started thinking, well, if we have those people come, they're paying us so much more money. So the traditions that we had around, you know, taking care of each other and taking care of guests started to diminish. And now it's actually gotten to the point where there's a lot of, you know, um, there's particularly like there's a study abroad programs where they fund uh, uh, students and then they pay for their homestays. So the whole idea of homestay has become very distorting in terms of you know, how, how people see the community and relate to, to guests and things. So that was one, one kind of example where we've seen like a flow of funds coming in and then starting to distort community relationships and things. Um, another thing um, which is around, um, uh, we've seen a lot also the flow of money um, uh, donors funding government and NGOs, they tied up with Monsanto company uh, and um, to f uh, start to push free seeds into the community. So traditions again around seed saving and seed, seed sharing have started to diminish where you know all this, um, right now they're giving free corn seeds, free um, Soya bean seeds, free beet, um, uh, genetically modified cotton seeds were being handed out. And so, um, again, the, the, the relationships between people around mutual care and mutual, helping each other in their fields and things have started to shift because of all this, again, flow of money into the community where people think, well, I'm getting this much money, so why should I help my neighbor out? Um, why should I share seeds with them? And also the entire our seed security is being put at risk because of all this money coming in and people then thinking, well, I'm getting these free seeds, so why should I take time to store my own seeds and things? So, you know, within a few years, indigenous varieties of seeds are disappearing quite quickly. And this money that's flowing in, how, uh how much is it meeting the needs of the community? Um, so it's, it is, I mean, in some type, uh, you can see a short-term need being met in terms of some immediate cash. Uh, uh, you see, um, but you also see people being connected more to the global economy, being pulled into that, like people, if they're shifting their crops from indigenous local varieties, um, a lot of millets grow in our area. So people are leaving those millets which are drought resistant and which are very nutritious and, and going in for cash crops. So the funding is supporting them to do that. Um, but whether it's long term sustainable or what's going to happen, they're, actually their diets are also diminishing in that process. So income is going up and diet is diminishing, the soil quality is d diminishing. Uh, so you see that you know across the board with a lot of different 
things. Um, so on the surface, it looks like you know maybe their income has increased, but so many things in um, India function by the gift culture. So there's a lot of you know an invisible web of of relationships, care, sharing, uh, mutual aid, uh, hospitality, um, service, which actually once it starts being commodified into money, um, it's actually you know quite expensive, and all of a sudden people can't afford it. You know, like. So there'd be things like, you know, um, if you go to, if someone gets, if you get sick, for example, you know, a whole group of friends, family will come and the, stay in the hospital with you, care for you, bring food every day for you there. And so that's not like at all commodified uh, right now. But then as soon as you shift to a, you know, professionalized system where you have to start paying, then, uh, you start to be in a situation of scarcity, you know, that you need so much money all of a sudden and it's yeah. not around. So so it looks like income is there, but the actually cost of things have also gone up. So your actually real amount, real economic power is decreasing in that process. Do you so. feel that people in India are starting to become aware of, of the problem or are they, uh, for the most part, still kind of believing in this, you know, I'm gonna- I think most this. NGOs are actually quite stuck in it because once you get, you know, you build up, a, what happens is again, if you get a lot of money, you start to build up your organizational infrastructure, your costs grow. So actually what shifts then is not your focus or depth around your work. It actually, you need to start getting continuous rounds of money to just support the basic infrastructure. So a lot of people get stuck in that trap. Um, there is, a, I think, I mean, there are different kinds of people's movements which are questioning this. Um, you know, there's um, uh, several times a kind of ban the World Bank, uh, kick out the World Bank kind of movements are there which would say we don't need funds and debt from, from the World Bank. But um, for the most part, I think the people are like, um, because you, unless you're sensitive to the gift culture, and the possibilities that are within communities and how they're actually caring for each other. Um, one thinks that one is doing good by bringing in all this money. And the problem is obviously with the indicators we have also, which also show like, you know, as you destroy local localization, local economy and local e ecology and local culture, you see some growth of your, you know, economic growth is showing it that it's going up. So there's a illusion that things are improving in that process. Um, you want to tell me uh, uh, what is what is the gift what is the gift economy? You want to tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. So there's um, um, so we we think of it as a culture, right? Um, it's a whole tradition of things which um, have been kept sacred uh, in the sense they've not been they've been prevented from being commodified traditionally. Uh, for example, f food, water, uh, nature, all of these things, uh, even, uh, you know, love, human relationships, care. So this was actually functioning in a different domain uh, um, traditionally in India. Like, so we have a tradition um, which, is, which has shifted quite a bit um, with, the, with, you know, bottled water. But traditionally, you would, people would actually set up uh, little stalls outside of their house and have you know, pots of water for visitors. Any visitor who was passing by, any weary traveler, could stop there, sit, have some water. They wouldn't pay for it. And it would be seen as a great, you know, blessing if somebody stopped at your place. And, and it, you know, it was, it was a very spiritual gesture to be able to give somebody water. So that has shifted, for example. Actually, my, my first uh, encounter with all of this was with, with spiritual healers. Uh, traditional people working with medicinal plants and different kinds of alternative healing. And so when I went and met them, um, you know, they, they had long lines of people who are coming to them and, you know, being treated by them. And I noticed that they didn't charge money for what they were doing. Um, so, you know, you could leave if you felt like it. Uh, you could leave uh, some grains or some uh, a chicken or, you know, uh, if you didn't have anything, you didn't have, to, there was no expectation that you had to leave something. Um, so I asked them, you know, you're, you, you have a, per, you know, presumably a good business here. There's a lot of people coming, they found your treatment effective, so why don't you charge some money? You know, you can, uh, uh, this was many years ago, so this whole social entrepreneurship 
mentality of like converting things and making money out of them uh, when trying to do social good was still you know part of my mindset so it's like you know this is a great thing you can scale this up earn a lot of profit from this and you know share that back so they responded you know there are some things very sacred um, if we started charging for this this is a this is a gift we've been re received from the divine if we started charging for this we'd lose all our powers and all of these things would disappear so that started me thinking that there are so many things in our society which are in that realm um, which people you know have in their everyday lives they relate to the, the basic you know uh, uh, essential things for living and living a you know a good life a healthy life uh, a holistic life so you know those those are different things which I found people do they connect to they're all you know now with the onslaught of the the global market uh, obviously a lot of these things are changing too have you seen situations where not only the money didn't help but it actually was in direct contradiction to the work that say a different an organization was trying to do um yeah let me think about it yeah, <laughs> exactly <works>. uh, <laughs> Let me say a couple more things about the gift culture, though, okay. too, because I think there's a lot of, uh, also in India, there's a strong tradition of service, seva, and actually the root meaning of seva is uh, interconnectedness. It means thread, so thread in the sense of being interconnected with, with each other. So all of those traditions we see of, of seva, those are being, you know, diminished as people start to think that, you know, in the in the in the in civil society, there you know that okay, there's all this money coming in, so we should get money for what we're doing. But so there there's one example which I've seen a lot of like you know conflict coming up because you know people start wondering, well, I'm in the spirit frame of service, the cosmology of service, and working in that, and all of a sudden this person comes in and they're getting money for that. So that creates real real conflict between people on what you know what is our relationship with with the rest of civil society and things like that. Yeah. So, um, in terms of, um, I mean, I've seen in many organizations where what's happened because of the flow of, you know, lots of um, uh, donor funds is that people's own agendas get lost, um, community agendas get lost where um, whereas actually, you know, it's more focused on the project that you're bringing rather than what communities really need or want or, you know, and there's a general focus more on surface level kinds of interventions. So like, because they're, you know, and, um, with money comes a lot of corruption also, right? So, um, so people prefer projects which involve infrastructure construction, school buildings, hospital buildings, um, road construction so these kinds of projects start to become more the core of what um, uh, NGOs start working on because there's a lot of room there for you know uh, taking off so, you know eating off the sides of it uh, we call it chai pani money which is like food for like you know a cup of tea and stuff I'm sorry money for a cup of tea how is that chai pani chai chai pani is like tea water so people you say you know uh, can you give me something for chai pani for, for having so that means you know a good kickback or something so um, and there's also been you know so a lot of um, very big game that's come up with you know people um, you know along the way of the cycle funding cycle people all taking kickbacks you know so actually when you I've seen some organizations where you know they've get written for a hundred percent budget by the end of the kickbacks they get about fifty percent of the money that comes to their their organization because you have to whether it's at the government level you have to pay back or you, you have people who are you know there's a whole now cadre of proposal professional proposal writers in English who have been built up who actually make a living off of just writing proposals and then they take a you know a chunk of the funds that come in um, so there's that kind of stuff that's happening there. when it seems like this monic you know monetized system is so dominant um, want to talk about some solutions that you've seen that people are, are trying to that are doing to try to break free from this yeah um, so I think the um, 
you know, the, the exciting solutions are, you know, um, where people, people are moving away. Like I know one organization, when they uh, started their work, they didn't, uh, they wanted to have, you know, the communities buy in on, on things. So they actually asked the community to contribute grains. Um, so wherever, you know, the, the money system actually uh, helps to perpetuate a model where you see communities in deficit and scarcity. Um, and so if one can move out of that and start to see communities uh, in terms of the kinds of um, uh, human and um, physical gifts that they have, which they might be able to contribute into a process, you find that there's more connection with the community. And, and the, the other thing that's, that's actually shifted quite a bit, just, just to go back to our previous conversation, was you know, the, there's a real shift of who is a, uh, accountability that happens with this, with this um, funding cycle, right? So you're, all your annual reports are written in English then. Uh, so the community has no, no idea of what actually has uh, gone on. There's no space for reflection with the community that you work with. And um, so the accountability is more to the donor agency than to the communities that are, that are being worked with. So that's a very radical shift that has happened in the last 20, 25 years in, in, in India. Um, so in terms of good examples, um, so I can share one thing in our own organization of our, we've ex tried to experiment a lot with the gift culture and, and tapping in uh, to it. So, one thing we've had as an organizational policy for the last uh, 10 years has been to try to increase our activities and decrease our budget. So we've been very successful to, at, at doing that. And in terms of de increasing activities and kinds of relationships we're building with people, people offering, for example, like um, empty spaces that they have, whether it's, you know, um, um, spaces for meeting, conferencing, spaces for um, farming, urban farming, uh, spaces for staying. Um, we have people who are, you know, the whole network of people who are willing to share those things uh, into the network. There's a lot of people who, um, we do a lot of things with um, waste. So the whole idea of shifting our mindset from seeing waste as a negative thing to seeing waste as, a, as an asset. So there's lots of, you know, programs we are able to do with kids using waste and, and making things out of waste so you don't have to buy all the time art supplies and you know and create more waste out of that but actually taking things so a lot of for example um, jewelry out of waste so you do a lot of interesting art projects um, which both boys and girls get into quite a bit and using things that they can find around their house and making their own kinds of um, jewelry since that's a quite a popular thing among youth right yeah. So I think you start to look for different things that are sitting in the community. Um, and you know, we did this, um, it's quite interesting. Um, uh, we worked with a group from Brazil um, called uh, Ilos Institute, and they run something called the Oasis Game. So um, another thing that we did was uh, with them is was to go into the communities, Start from a point of view of seeing what the what the beauty is in the community, rather than always looking for the negative things, um, and then seeing the beauty and talking about with spending a fair amount of time talking to the community about what their dreams are for their community, and then actually um, building something together with the community. And the entire process it was quite beautiful. Um, used resources, natural materials, waste materials that were already sitting in the community. Uh, we didn't bring anything from the outside. So it was quite, uh, you know, I think real empower, empowerment was happening with people actually started to really feel that we have so much already in our community, we're not using it well, we're not working together well, and if we start doing that, we don't really need to to be, um, you, know, we, you know, putting our hands out and asking for funds all the time. And it was great, you know, people had some in their house, you know, some old wood sitting around, some people had some old bricks sitting around, some stones sitting here. And we have, you know, traditional techniques where you can use clay and cow dung to, you know, build with and things. So, um, so all of that started happening and lots of people came and, you know, started sharing their skills and things. So that, that potential lies in communities. It's, I think the idea is to create processes which help that come out. 
Um, rather than, you know, the money in one sense makes people really lazy. Uh, and that, uh, you know, I've seen over and over, I've been to other villages where, you know, there is a whole community process where people would, you know, um, get together and clean out silt, you know, from their water storage areas. And um, those things, uh, you know, I, was, I had been visiting this one community and I was asking them, you know, why, why is it still dirty? Why aren't you doing it? So they were like, we're waiting for the funds to come, then we'll do it. So they've stopped doing things that they traditionally would do together. Um, you know, in, 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 way, in hope, and so they sit around saying, well, nothing's going on in our community, we can't do anything, and we need all those funds. And actually, if you just go back, you know, 10 years ago even, you would find that they were actually doing, they're much more self-reliant and doing many more of the things that they were doing. And the other thing I think that this whole funding thing, which is, they certainly has generated a lot of corruption and waste. Um, and so, so like our fiscal year ends every year in March, so you get a ton of calls from people who want to all of a sudden have to spend all the money that they've received, and they you know, spend it on outrageous, stupid things. And I think that creates, you know, a real, you know, for for communities, it's like a real distortion in their, you know, like what's going on here, you know, like how can people be, you know, throwing away all this money on useless things, you know, like and. Uh, so that also creates much more confusion, like what exactly then is, you know, is the priority of this organization? Is it actually to do something in the community or is it actually to hold on to this money and then just spend it on, on irrelevant and unnecessary things that then usually like on, you know, they, they usually take community members to like some fancy hotel and have a, you know, meeting there and spend a lot of money on that saying, okay, well, this is an activity we did and things like that, so. How open, you know, people in the community, you know, obviously, like you said, cleaning up the silt are things that were done traditionally on a non-commodified basis that are now commodified. How, um, I mean, have you had conversations with people about this and how uh, open are they to, like, kind of questioning, going, like, wait a minute, like, how did we get here, what's going on, or are they just kind of going with the flow, or, you know? You um, it depends. I think what's interesting is this is where, actually, education comes in. So, uh, usually the older, so-called illiterate people are the most wise, and they know what's going on, and they're quite disturbed by it. And younger people um, who um, have gone to school, you know, usually, in villages, it'd be the class 10 or class 12 most of the time, or some, some people who've gone to college who come there. They actually um, have very little questions about what's going on, and they've actually situated themselves as middlemen between, you know, a donor, the donors coming in or the NGOs coming in and the local community. So because employment is, you know, they didn't learn any real skills in school, so then they, they you know, <laughs> Have setting up their own local community organization or NGO becomes a kind of income generation activity for them. So there's there's not as much concern. So we've found a lot of good response from older people. The only thing is the education system has shut them up, right? Because it's put this label of, on them as these people are illiterate, backwards, whatever. So their voice doesn't matter. But those are actually people, elders are vo voicing the strongest kinds of concerns about you know how things are shifting out of uh, out of gift culture into commodification. So we're trying to create, you know, so the idea is to then to create processes where where those voices, those those things can come in and people start questioning. Because again, what's what's happening on the short term, it looks like you're progressing, mm -hmm. but you're basically the progress is coming at the expense of of eating away your entire you know local base of assets and relationships and community, right? Um, so like, we're, I think the, the more fundamental question which comes with this money thing is also related to the whole question of development. So people, you know, coming with these development projects, very big projects, the assumption in those projects being, okay, we need to, if we raise people's incomes, things will be okay. Um, so I think it's, uh, and, and what, as I said, what, what happens is that actually if it's so many things that are not, you know, um, uh, measured, get destroyed uh, in that process. So like when you hear these statistics, like, oh, these people live on $1 a day, 
if you have a vibrant gift culture, it's not hard to live on one dollar a day, you know, and be very sustainable in your lifestyle, um, and very and, and generally be more happier in your life, lifestyle. But as soon as you, yeah, the more things you put into the commodifi commodified, you know, the money economy, then obviously one dollar is not sufficient. So, you know, I think that um, where where the you know the most exciting efforts are where people are actually seeing things, you know, uh, around herbal herbal things. You see, there's some really strong groups I know of in India, for example, which are really trying to keep herbal healing uh, into the into the realm of the gift culture as well. Um, also, groups fighting where you know water resources and. Uh, land, common land resources where that remains also in the realm of gift culture domain. So those are probably the strongest efforts where one sees it. So I've always had this feeling that um, there's a relationship between the NGO work that's being done mm -hmm. and big business. And have you seen anything like that with, um, you know, you have an NGO that's coming to maybe yeah. placate a community that's, uh, you know, that they're they're trying to alleviate some of the mm -hmm. suffering that's being done by the corporation. You know, I know in India, like, water is a big issue and, you know, a lot of farmers mm -hmm. uh, have committed suicide and whatnot. Have you have you noticed any anything where it was kind of a little bit more glaring uh, in terms yeah. of the relationship between the NGO and the corporation, the, the for-profit corporation? Um, well, I can give you an example. There's um, there's a project with a local NGO which is quite large in our community, one of the oldest, and MIT Poverty Lab. So what they are doing is. Um, in certain communities, they've identified some uh, anemia and uh, iron deficiency. So what they started doing is they started bringing in iron supplements uh, and mixing it into the local grains to try. It. So they got a whole project to set up this experiment. So I've been in meeting, I met some people a few years ago around it. I was saying, why don't we look at their traditional diets and see what's sh shifted and how to actually maybe strengthen things that were in their diets, um, which, they've, which they've stopped consuming, uh, which would grow locally and could be produced locally. So there was a lot of resistance to that, and the project didn't accept to add that as a dimension to it. So you have, you know, this whole effort then. Um, same thing with, um, one can see with a lot of NGOs introducing uh, soya bean. Uh, into people's diets because that's a direct link to, you know, soya is a commodity, a big one that people don't eat soya bean in India traditionally uh, in any form. Tofu, we don't have tofu, we don't have, um, you know, soya powder really is not consumed in, in any kind of flour, or, I mean, as a flour in any kinds of breads or rotis that we have. Um, so you see a lot of the NGOs um, working on introducing those things in people's diets as well. Um, so there is, uh, I mean, in the terms of iron supplements, I think there's much, there is a kind of link because you want people to get dependent on, you know, consuming external vitamins and things like that, which rather than looking at, you know, what was, like, in, and I know in those communities for sure, there were things like um, different kinds of local millets, like amaranth, which is very high in iron contact, uh, content, and it's very, um, they also had a lot of interesting um, um, uh, wild kinds of leafy vegetables uh, which they were consuming, which are also high in iron content. And so those things have diminished. So, you know, our thing would be to, you know, what we've been trying to do is to support those kinds of things that were traditionally there and people could actually rely on, on themselves without bringing in all this this extra um, stuff. And then obviously the other thing I want to mention with the case of like seeds is a big thing where you see the direct connection with, you know, NGOs. And there's not, you know, so that what I've, what's really disturbing for me is like people's own, you know, the N, people are working in NGOs, um, often good friends of mine, their own common sense and wisdom seems to have taken second, uh, taken a back seat to, to the funding cycles and to the you know pressure to have continuous projects funded and things so what they're getting it for you know they could you know flip-flop very easily they take a project this year you know focusing on 
um, you know, GM seeds. And next year, if there was a project uh, on organic food, which was well funded, they would. I've seen groups which would flip flop like that, which is, in one sense, if they're flip flopping for the good things, which is a, is a good thing. But you know, they would flap back and forth. So their own clarity about their work it becomes very distorted because of the funding cycles and things, and um, this false sense of arrogance and um, self righteousness has also emerged with that. Mm. Have you had conversations with people working in NGOs about this and, and their concerns about this? I have. Um, so there's a sense of helplessness generally in a lot of them because you know it's tied to their salaries. So without that would mean that they would have to also start to look for other forms of, of income or, or support from communities. Um, so I think there's a generally um, I mean, for the most part, a resistance to wanting to, to shift that model until there is some fear, um, which might be a positive thing to, to build on, I think, which I've tried to also talk about is, like, you know, what if the funding dries up? What are you going to do? Do you have ideas about how to sustain your work or, you know, even yourselves and that kind of thing? So there's a, you know, a little bit of openness around talking about from that perspective. Um, um, also, when we talk about it, you know, I, I try to say, you know, like, look, let's look at this community, you know, 30 years ago before your presence, you know, they were 95% self-reliant. And let's see now how they've shifted. Uh, so there's a, it's pretty shocking to people when they look at it from that perspective, you know, like what has actually happened. Um, but you know the people in NGOs are quite dependent on the money economy themselves, so it's quite difficult to ask them to, you know, shift. It would mean a radical shift in their own lifestyles because this is the other thing that's happened is, um, you know, so you don't um, because of the funds are um, usually directed at certain communities and rural areas. So the question around your own lifestyle. And your own, um, you know, um, connection to the problem uh, gets kind of sidelined because you're out. The funds are telling you to go and work in their community. So most of the time, people who are in NGOs don't know what's happening in their own communities where they live, uh, usually in urban areas or semi-urban areas. So their community engagement is actually decreased because of that as well. Because they, you know, the funds tell them go work in that community, and so you find uh, very different. Um, the energy of civil society has shaken quite a bit, and and also people's confidence in NGOs and civil societies organizations has 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 weakened. You know, there's a lot of skepticism around, you know, that NGOs are just trying to make a fast buck as well among a lot of communities which they've seen it because of the waste and because, you know, they see a lot of, you know, um, lavishness, perceived lavish you know, NGO people driving in in uh, fancy cars, staying at nicer hotels, you know, and so it's kind of, you know, there's a very famous book, Lords of Poverty. Um, I don't know if you've seen it ever, but it's it's worth checking out. There's a really nice poem in that uh, about the development jet set. So local communities see that also. They're not stupid, right? And they see like all of the funds that are that are going there, and so that's shaken people's trust and faith in in, um, in those organizations. Um, so these communities are basically becoming dependents on uh, NGO help. A lot of a lot of them. Do you feel? Um, Yes and no. There is dependence going on. At the same time, there's obviously because of traditions don't can't be eliminated so easily. There are other systems that are you know working still, and if not fully, but at least partially, where people are still involved in in these kinds of relationships of mutual aid and care and hospitality and things like that. So um, you know, like one of the things we've done, um, we do is uh, we do this. You know, so we are, one of the things we're trying to support in our work is how people unlearn their dependency on money and their fear around money, their own sense of insecurity around money, which then prevents them from making uh, more meaningful 
life choices, you know, because you're always thinking, well, this is what I really want to do, but what am I going to do to survive and how will I, you know, have enough money in that and, you know, a lot of this kind of, I mean, the, the uh, middle class angst has basically been introduced to everyone through the education system of all classes, right? So, um, so we invite different friends and we do a cycle yatra. Yatra means um, like pilgrimage or journey, um, so external as well as internal. And we spend one week with people without money living in villages so they can actually re-experience what the gift culture is and fantastic ways that it comes out, uh, people get connected. And the thing, one thing that really hits people is, you know, um, and hit me particularly when I, several years ago in the first did this, is though you, uh, people who have very little are still quite giving in what they have um, of, of their time, their uh, their food, limited food resources, their limited physical resources, they're quite giving and, and willing to share that and uh, uh, in the spirit of a deeper sense of solidarity, connection. And people who have more and more things and are more tied to the money economy, they're much more afraid about giving uh, or, or losing what they have, you know. So it's a very bizarre paradox where, you know, we, we um, in Hindi, you say um, uh, uh, "dil chota hora." So people's hearts are growing smaller as they become more and more connected into into the money and global economy and things that they don't they have trouble. Anyway. And there's a whole sense of hoarding that builds up, right? Whereas we've found in traditional communities, the whole idea of gift culture is is the flow. You know, keep the things moving. You're not supposed to hoard resources. You know. Um, so I think this whole commod commodification creates a whole spirit of hoarding and it also creates a whole um, set of distortion around how to value things, you know. So if this is the money value, it doesn't mean that's what the real value of things are, you know. So how do you value a river, how do you value um, uh, a, tr a forest, you know, or how do you develop value a whole web of community relationships and, and bonds. As um, soon as we put money value on those things, I think we're actually devaluing those things. And there's a tremendous amount of arrogance then which enters into our decision-making process. So that one sees, you know, happening. And unfortunately, you know, lots of good people and civil society organizations have gotten caught up in this. Um, there's an interesting story actually, it reminds me, when Gandhi, um, uh, when he was starting, he started this, um, uh, there's actually two little stories I'll tell you which are quite interesting. One is from Gandhi, when he started the, what he called Natalim schools, which were the new system of education which was trying to be, come out of the colonial models. So one of the things he was quite insistent on was that um, those, those centers, learning centers, uh, develop their own self-sufficiency. And he was quite clear that, you know, he didn't want government funds which were based on alcohol sales and tobacco sales and arms sales, tax money that's coming in through that, to come to support the, the, the projects and institutions that he was running. And so that was quite a, it was controversial because it meant that, you know, kids would be actually working and then you have all these child labor guys coming and saying, how could children be working in this? And he was, you know, this whole philosophy that no, work is also learning and as long as it's not exploitative, then it's a good thing actually. So, but, um, so there was also, you know, in, in his own thought, a, a desire to keep, keep this whole spirit of community self-reliance alive rather than bringing in all these institutions which are then there to replace, you know, um, community efforts and things. Um, the other really interesting story, there was um, there's a guy, Vinoba Bhave, who was the spiritual successor to Gandhi, um, very close to Gandhi, and he actually, there was this whole movement he led called the Budan Gramdan movement. So it was kind of the land gift movement. Uh, and what he did was he went from community to community and he tapped into this tradition. He said, well, in, your, in our tradition, you know, you, if you have this much land and you have four sons, you, you should split that land among your four sons. So he said, 
uh, adopt me as your fifth son. And whatever the land that you would give uh, to your fifth son, that would go to me. And I would put that in a kind of back in a community land grant to be redistributed and things. So it was a very different spirit that was tapping into this whole tradition thing to try to bring things back into the you know, um, commons and to rebuild the commons. So that I think is, you know, some, those are things I find inspiring of how you can actually bring more things back into the commons. There's some NGOs who are working on like with forest rights and things to create a sense of commons still rather than involved being privatized. And so those are actually positive kinds of things also. Happening. Are you, um, how do you feel about the future? I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, sometimes you look around and it's, it seems kind of grim. <laughs> Are, are you are you uh, are you are you feeling positive about the direction of things um, in spite of everything? <laughs> I I do feel positive actually because I still feel that you know things like um, gift culture. Uh, once you start start to tune into it, you can experience it not only in India. You can experience it in Boston or Denver or. San Francisco, there's spaces where one can start rebuilding that. Um, and I, I'm positive that there's still, you know, um, despite everything that's going on, there's still something, you know, some common sense, some wisdom, some human conscience that exists with people. Uh, and as long as that's there, and a sense of love, intimacy is still possible between people. Uh, I, I find there's a little bit of hope in that. And if we can create processes, you know, so there's, that's the problem, like, you know, I, I said with, when you have projects that are coming in, which are, you know, making those things invisible, that's the fear. But, as, but still, I think I've seen enough of human resilience and human goodness that it, somehow you still find pockets where that, that you know, appears. And, uh, you know, as things get worse in the, in the, with the collapse of different kinds of systems, I think those spaces will start to grow again. In a sense, it's, you know, what's needed is actually to remove the drug a bit, because money and this flow of funds have, has become a kind of drug. And if some of it withdraws, then, you know, one sees, and particularly in times of crisis or some kind of calamity, that all of a sudden, for a brief period, there's a lot of, you know, connection and, and care for each other and helping out each other and things before the funds start arriving again <laughs> which yeah. is, but those are where I see you know some some hope when, when that spirit can can reemerge it's still there so it's a question of finding the right spaces and processes to connect to that and particularly if we can um, I think a lot more effort if we can give to unlearning um, some of the core assumptions that we grew up with another interesting thing which I I had to get rid of in my own life was, you know, so when I was growing up, my, you know, my parents had, you know, commitment to service work and altruism, but they always said, you know, um, um, earn a lot of money and then you can volunteer, right? Uh, so I think, um, you know, you get trapped in that, that kind of uh, story then. And so at some point now I started, I walked out of that story and said I don't really need to earn a lot of money. I can start doing the things I want to do today even. And if you start, you know, there's a, there's a word we have in Hindi called jugard, which means like improvisation, figuring it out with whatever you have. So we're trying to encourage people to tap back into that spirit because whatever you have around you, you can start doing something. And when you start doing that, Slowly by slowly, you can move in a direction where you don't need to rely on big money. And, and by doing that, you are actually creating the alternative um, rather than saying, OK, I'm going to have. I think the, the interesting thing is to move out of this mindset that you know we need a lot of money to do good in the world or to do something meaningful. And if we shift out of that and say, whatever we have around us, let's start seeing how we can play around with that and do something meaningful. Um, that I think would be a real strong step in the right direction, you know. And, and so. Was there like a catalyst that made that, that got you to the point where you walked out? I mean, I, you said you went to Harvard. Mm -hmm. uh, was was there something that happened or something you saw that that, that you know caused a shift in you? Um, I think what I saw over and over again was, um, you know, this this deficit thinking, like looking at people and communities through the lens of you know, being poor, backward, stupid, ignorant, 
illiterate, all of these words. Um, I had done my uh, master's in school of education, and so this is how people around the global south are referred to continuously. And whenever I would hear that, I, I would look at my, my grandmother, who was in a village, who all of these labels would apply to, but the reality was quite different. What her role, her contribution in our family, in our community, um, uh, the kind of wisdom, the kind of love, the you know intelligence that she displayed, despite never going to school or being part of any formal systems, uh, was amazing. And I saw a lot of hope in those people. So I think that um, I got tired of that narrative of, of how people. And then it was there. I was in UNESCO. I worked with UNESCO, UNICEF, the World Bank, USAID, all of these big donor agencies. And I saw that they were always going in with this arrogance. Uh, that we know how to solve people's problems. And then when things went wrong, they wouldn't take responsibility for it. They'd find some way, oh, the community didn't cooperate, or the NGO was you know, uh, inefficient, or the government you know, was corrupt, or you know, whatever. So there was no you know, ownership of, which is like what professionals are trained to do, right? You talk big, and then when things go wrong, you kind of disappear from the scene. So seeing that over and over again, um, I decided that that wasn't something that I wanted to be part of. And also this whole top-down arrogance nature of that, where you, you know, people are, um, you think that you're you're doing good, but you're actually it's the money that's attracting people. It's not the work anymore. And so that becomes very disturbing. So when we started our organization, we didn't we didn't we decided as a policy we weren't going to take funds from governments, donor agencies, big foundations, anything like that. Um, so it was actually the other thing which is very interesting is um, which disturbed me a lot when uh, so I used to see a lot of is you know you'd be working with somebody in a foundation or a donor agency and they would say you know um, personally I like what you're doing I agree with what you're doing but my institution won't allow it. So they would create this, you know, this invisible glass wall of the institution to, um, even though they liked what you were saying, to, to actually hide behind that, that they didn't have to make a, a different decision or support something that was outside of the frame of what their institution. So I, I got very put off by that and very uh, irritated by that, you know, that people, you know, if you say you don't like what, you, what someone's doing, you can deal with that. But if somebody's saying, I like it, but can't do it, then you know one has a lot of questions about what's the frame which people are oper operating in. So we decided we didn't want to play that game with people, and so pe we, you know, people and contribute to the movement and using a variety of different ways. But it's all as individuals, so you know they can support what you know the things that they actually believe in, and, and so we we want to create more of that, and we we try to initiate that with a lot of partners. Um, Another thing we've done is like um, all of the uh, kinds of workshops and events we do, we operate in gift culture on that. So we've had a lot of good experience with that where, you know, whatever, we leave it to people to contribute whatever they want. Because this is another really weird thing is like people started thinking now, unless we put a high price on what we're doing, nobody will value it. I don't know if you've, you've seen that probably around too. So I think that, you know, a whole range of we end up actually feeding an elitist and you know capitalist model by by continuously trying to put you know money value on what we're doing. It's not to say that people obviously have bills to pay and all of that, but some I think a lot of the things that we're drawing from we are actually diminishing the sacred in those by by putting money value in. So we've done a lot of experiments with asking people to you know contribute whatever they can. Um, and so it ends up balancing out, you know, people who can contribute more. It's, you know, we say, we say contribute what you can plus a little bit more to help, you know, um, support others in this whole community. Yeah. So we've done that for the last seven, eight years and had a great success with, with doing that. Um, what's the name of your organization? What's the website? It's called uh, Shikshantar. Uh, and, um, um, we call it a Jivan Andalan, which is, Andalan means movement, and Jivan means life. So it's a life movement, it's a movement which starts with our own lives rather than going and preaching to others what they need to do, but how do we actually invite that movement into our own lives and small things we do in everyday life. So, and starting with 
reclaiming control of our own learning processes. So outside of the framework of formal schools and, and education, but how actually people can shift to. Because I think that's the most dangerous thing that's being commodified is, you know, so learning is essential to our evolution as, a, as, as you know, human beings. And so you've commodified that whole thing into something called education. And I think that creates, you know, the distortive and destructive effects ripple out throughout the system. Um, and you, you know, you think then you need to have money to learn, which is, a, you know, a great well, crime, we, I think. You know? Now we see uh, student <laughs> Debt, yeah, exactly. Uh, surpassing regular debt, you yeah, know? And yeah. So <laughs> you've got this servitude. This yeah. Second you get out of college. Yeah. So and the other thing we were talking about yesterday, like for me, so did, I think it's important we we need to deconstruct the meaning of development. The word sounds very nice, but actually wherever it's shown up in communities in a powerful way, I've I've seen at least three different phenomena happening. Uh, one being the um, um, uh, increase of mining and extraction kinds of activities uh, in those communities. The second is um, the uh, increase of debt uh, in those communities. And farmer suicides, you mentioned, is one extreme example of that. But it was basically on, you know, based because it happened because of debt got out of control for people. And the third is spread of monoculture. So these are the things that are actually happening with when money ties up with the development model. And so it looks like we're doing good things, but if you actually go between the surface, most of the places I've seen in Africa, India, South America, the Middle East, that you can find these things also in parallel happening. So, you know, it's a matter of, of bringing those into our lenses. Are these things that we are looking at when we are, you know, doing NGO projects or, you know, development projects in communities? If we started to assess those, then we might see that it's actually not the positive gain that we're, we're presuming by looking at only one, in, which is rise in income levels, right? Um, yeah. I've seen that, you know, in even poor, poorest of the, what's so-called poorest of the world, these are getting labels, right? Communities, when they want to do something, they can generate resources, you know, so a small example is if they want to build a temple or a mosque, somehow they come up with the money to do those things, right? So, uh, so I think that there are tons, of, there's, a, and you know, there's people unfortunately who are tapping into this from the business community, right? When they create this whole bottom of the pyramid kind of angle, I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, so there was a guy, business school professor C.K. Prahlad who wrote this book, Bottom of the Pyramid. Mm -hmm. So he's talking about how much even poor communities have a lot of resources and assets. So it's a very devious, diabolical kind of way of thinking, right? That, oh, we can actually create mechanisms to suck those out of communities as well. So one of the things that they praise, which has become a nightmare, is you know these one rupee kinds of packets. Um, like whether it's a, a, you know, a packet for tobacco or a packet for shampoo, these little pouches which uh, people can, you know, because they always have one rupee or five rupees in their pockets. They wouldn't have like, so buying something in bulk would mean you need to have like a hundred rupees or something for that or a thousand rupees, whatever. But if you, if something you want to consume, if it's made available for one rupee or five rupees, you know, millions of people can consume it all of a sudden. And where the nightmare part of it is, is that as soon as they consume it, they throw it away and it becomes, you know, huge mounds and mounds of trash that is being generated because of the, the packaging for this, this one rupee kinds of things. So they're, they're tapping into it in a very, um, I, I think, you know, another kind of exploitative way. But uh, it just shows you that there's a ton of, there's actually quite a bit of things in communities when they, when they can generate that. Well, here in the States, we have uh, an increasing number of dollars, they're called dollar stores. Mm -hmm. And so it's just cheap junk that's like throwaway stuff. And so people buy it when maybe they don't even really need it, but it's so cheap and they just throw it away. But it's actually not cheap. I, I discovered this because I, I needed, uh, I, I, we, we had this barbecue and I went to go they sent me to go pick up some, some paper plates, um, which I know it's bad, paper plates. But the dollar store, um, they, you know, it was a dollar, but it was only like a handful of plates. And, and I, I, I compared the prices to the regular store. It was actually more expensive at yeah. the dollar store, but, but because it was, the buy-in was a lower right. amount that, that people, you know, that don't have enough yeah. money to buy in like, you know, bulk or whatever, yeah, yeah. Uh, would buy into this. And, and again, like you're creating this situation where 
people are buying stuff that maybe, you know, it's not maybe the best route, and then they're throwing it away or whatever. Yeah. Because, hey, it was a buck, you know. It, yeah. like, a buck, people don't think of it as disposable. Yeah. You know, it, it's only a dollar. <laughs> so you find that in India, like our traditional, since you mentioned plates, we would um, have the plates traditionally are made out of leaves, beautiful leaf plates and bowls, um, which are obviously biodegradable and everything. And so um, the way the money economy has worked is it's actually made it, uh, people perceive it to be more cheaper and convenient to now buy plastic than to use support the local economy where people are making these plates and these plates could be, you know. So that's where you know the the there's a tremendous um, power, particularly when you link money to things like you know artificial subsidies and you know scarcity and things like that to manipulate prices of things, and you you create really kinds of um, bizarre behavior of people because of it, like where people would then use plastic cups and plates rather than using their natural things right, uh, right. because because of what money has done in terms of perception around price. So the real price we don't usually pay for the things that we're using which is which is I think another way that it's entered into the global economy you know communities all over. Uh, um, one last thing uh, maybe you might say a few words about in this, this increasingly monetized, commodified culture um, that's, that has built into it incredible scarcity, um, I see also an increase in gambling. And, and so people taking the scarce resources they have to buy lottery tickets or things like that. And that's another thing I'm curious about. Mm. Have, you seen, have you seen an increase in, in that sort of activity in India? Yeah, there is. And I think it's created, you know, partially um, you know, I, well, for a large part, media images, right? So there's a India imported that store. That's that, sorry. That um, India imported the um, uh, TV show Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. So I think you know, I was looking at you know at different friends' places, their their maids and their drivers. You know, they watch this show, and they, I think you know, they're like. There's something like totally incomprehensible. It's like somebody can sit there, I'm slugging away the whole day, you know, working 12, 14 hours a day and barely getting like, you know, 100 rupees. And somebody can like, you know, sit there for half an hour and answer like five questions and get, you know, half a million rupees or a million rupees. Like, it, it's got, it's like insane, right? So, so this whole idea, you people buy into this this myth of you know lottery ticket where it's actually it's contributing to further exploitation of theirs right but i think that seeing those kinds of images you can't reconcile right like i'm doing so much burn barely getting and how how can it be that somebody's just played a t gone on a tv show or just bought a ticket and gotten so much you know so it's what do you yeah. think of that movie slumdog millionaire because i, I kind of had an issue with it which it was it's like you know, it was kind of still playing into that. You can be a millionaire, and like the, yeah. the guy gets the princess and wins the the millionaire, yeah, yeah. and it's yeah. still kind of feeding into that 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 mythology. Yeah. So I mean, it's Hollywood, right? So <laughs> it has to be. But I, you know, one thing I liked about that film was it was very much um, um, giving something about uh, some reinforcement to the value of people's knowledge and experience. Like all of the ways he actually learned had nothing to do with formal schools or formal education. So in a sense, there was this other undercurrent message, which was saying that you know you can actually do a lot of things or may you know you know stuff just by living, and you don't need to be in school. Yeah. So if it helps people, you know, strip away this. See, there's a knowledge hierarchy that has come along with the money hierarchy, and when those two connect, then it's a very you know then you have a you know a totalitarian system in place. So I think the the easier thing right now, at least our strategy is to, I mean, one has to strip away at both of those. So the knowledge hierarchy, though, can be, you know, attacked quite easily because, uh, um, you know, people are seeing it in their own everyday lives, how it, you know, how today, like, even if you have a degree, you're not, you're not capable of doing so many things in your community, right? Uh, so that, and, and also how people's arrogance and their attitudes play out once they have more degrees. So it actually puts a lot of people off. Um, in NGOs, you see it in a big way. Like, so they have, you know, guys who have been from the local community who've been working for 15, 20 years, and all of a sudden some, you know, 
hotshot MBA guy comes in, like who's 23 or 24 years old, and all of a sudden they're their their boss, you know, like the boss of these people who've been who are from the community and working. So it's a lot of like you know resentment and you know, uh, and they see this person who comes in is there for a year, puts it on their CV that I've done my community work and jumps off to Delhi or Bombay or abroad. So that's you know building up and this whole thing. We actually have been. Um, we started a campaign called Healing Ourselves from the Diploma Disease. Uh, so it's actually asking organizations, um, social or we started with social organizations and movements to remove any requirement for diplomas or degrees from their hiring and promotion processes. So we've gotten quite a few of groups to agree to that. And I said start looking at people's portfolio of experience if they're high connected to communities if they know the local language, if they're committed to staying in the communities for long term. Um, uh, these are kinds of different things you may want to look at rather than you know what's the person's degree because the skills they're learning you could do in your own uh, in-house and you know how to write a proposal or how to use how to use Excel, these are things you can easily teach. But that deeper commitment uh, is something that you know is invaluable again. So many um, about multinational corporations and also Indian corporate houses have started to create their own um, philanthropy-based uh, foundations, which I think are very much, um, one can see how they're linked to their corporate interests and agendas. Um, so penetrating, I actually uh, met many you know, corporate leaders who are quite intrigued by our things and then um, they asked me, can you give us some more strategies of how do we penetrate the rural mind? You know, they're very explicit that the rural market is like where the next growth opportunity is what they see. So a lot of these houses are supporting NGOs to go in and then start marketing different, you know, insurance products or different financial banking instruments that they're going into local communities and trying to create, as well as, you know, um, more consumer driven behavior which is again, um, uh, you know, leads to the breakdown of, of community resilience and community sharing and mutual care and things. So there's a lot of these things which are posing as, you know, like big banks, um, there's ICICI Bank, and there's even State Bank of India, that they've started their, these fellowship programs and these uh, NGO, uh, you know, funding programs where they're sending you know, urban people into the rural areas to start to create this connection with the global economy and things in a different kind of way. One of the ways I've related this whole development game, one of the metaphors, is around steroids. So it's like injecting somebody with steroids. For the first few years, they look like, wow, that guy's got a great body, you know, like a bodybuilder type dude, and, you know, he's like really looks powerful and like real growth is happening. and. And then after a few years, they start becoming impotent and, you know, you know, sick and sterile in many different kinds of ways and unhealthy, right? So I think this is what one can see with a lot of these projects that are created, uh, Grameen Bank being one of them. Then on the surface, it looks like, wow, community incomes are growing and, you know, women are becoming more independent and healthy. But um, what I see is that the project undermines basic um, community and social fabrics that exist there and relationships in which um, well, there's an assumption, again, having more income will be, lead to well-being. Um, the trade-off is one has to look then how much um, the cost of living is increasing as you shift more and more of your things to commodi commodities, right? So people sharing, you know, um, services with each other, if all of a sudden those become small businesses, um, uh, that becomes, you know, uh, a way that actually is eroding social relationships where people are helping each other, taking care of each other, now they they approach it, well, this is a customer for me and I can make money off of them, which is a transaction-based thing. Um, also, the, the kind of behavior of, I think one has to look at how much waste it's generating in, in communities also. So, you know, the idea that, a small interesting thing was like in India when, um, Telephones were made, you know, public. Um, they used to have in every village, in every, even in urban areas, I remember, this is about 15 years ago, you could find, 10, 15 years back even. They'd have a, sh a shared um, uh, phone booth, um, which a guy would run, sit there, and 
everyone in the community when they needed to make a phone call was, would come and share that. So it was a, a kind of a collective resource or asset, you know? People are able to manage, I mean, with having one phone, you know, maybe 100 or 200 families could easily manage, or maybe even 500 families, right? And all of a sudden, then you shift the behavior to where everyone needs to have their own cell phone. And it becomes, a, so the Grameen Bank has started this whole, you know, women's cell phone thing too, where, you know, so that they're bringing in things and then trying to move towards individualistic types of behavior. So I think that needs to be questioned, you know, how does that actually in the long term help community fabric, whether family structures are breaking down. Um, I don't think, you know, an argument would be, well, uh, one is breaking down patriarchy through this by empowering women, but I, I think by, if one is empowering the global economy, there's no way you're breaking down, <laughs> you're bringing actually even more violent forces of patriarchy um, into communities. So it's not to say there weren't problems in those communities, definitely you know, power imbalances, but um, um, you know, there might be better ways. I think if one engages with, um, you know, I've seen very beautiful efforts where um, in, in different conservative Muslim communities, for example, where people, if they engage with the tradition in a meaningful way, one can open up different spaces for women and women's voices to come in there, rather than trying to erode the entire structure that's, that's been built up, you know, and where, which, which community thrives on and, and helps create community resilience. So. We're all, in a sense, trustees of the of the earth, right? Yeah. We're not owners of anything. So I think this whole idea of ownership that comes in actually is something that we need to shift out of in terms of so. Yeah. So money economy also creates this illusion that we're owners of something, you know, which is really bizarre. I had a um, once we were we were, we've been promoting like in our city rainwater harvesting. Um, so people have a lot of private tube wells they've created where they pump up water in their own houses. So those areas are very depleted. So we are giving, you know, sharing this simple technology where you can rooftop and help put it right into the tube well so it doesn't um, cost a lot of money to set this up. It was this bizarre, you know, response like, um, so the underground commons, they're like, well, how do we, if we put water back into the ground, how do we know we'll, it'll come back to us? So you're know, like, the water you're taking from the ground, how do you know it's your own water in the first place that you're taking, you know? So this whole idea, very bizarre notions of ownership and property that have crept into people's minds, you know? And the most exciting things are where people are working on regenerating commons, you know? And not just a commons which is isolated, but a commons which is actively engaged with by community and things, really. Because that's helping build them, you know? different kinds of bonds again between people. So many years ago I worked for USAID and um, at that, this was in the mid 90s there was this big debate going on whether USAID is needed and why are we giving aid to you know developing countries and things and um, one of the arguments that was put out um, uh, which was quite disturbing um, which I think we need to all reflect on is um, there's an argument that for every one dollar of U.S. money that goes in aid, foreign aid, ten dollars are earned in profits coming back. So I think the whole idea of whether, you know, is aid actually really, you know, good for communities or is it another way to make money off of local communities around the world is, is a question that really needs to be brought to, uh, you know, the public as well to engage with. And who was saying that? This was an argument. Um, of people who are in promotion for wanting to keep USAID intact. So it was some different researchers. The debate was around uh, whether it should be merged with the State Department. And so there was a you know, strong, no, it should remain in, in, uh, independent and autonomous so that it can continue with, with um, you know, this, this money-making agenda as well that it has. You know, serving corporate, you know, so the whole link of actually when I was working on the thing was quite disturbing as you can see very closely the link of bilateral aid and you know economic agreements and tie-ups you know whether it's priority treatment for American companies uh, tax breaks uh, granting of land to set up American factories with land at dirt cheap prices you know so all of that is happening as foreign aid is also 
going out, you know, buying of, you know, all of the purchasing that's done has to be of, you know, in that whether it's your computers, your cars, you know, consultants, everything has to be sent by America. So all of this happens in the name of aid as well. So upon hearing that, I quickly resigned from, from there, never to go there again. So <laughs> term need being met in terms of some immediate cash. Uh, uh, you see, um, but you also see people being connected more to the global economy being pulled into that, like people, if they're shifting their crops from indigenous local varieties, um, a lot of millets grow in our area. So people are leaving those millets which are drought resistant and which are very nutritious and, and going in for cash crops. So the funding is supporting them to do that. Um, but whether it's long-term sustainable or what's going to happen, they're, actually their diets are also diminishing in that process. So income is going up in diet, it's diminishing, the soil quality is d diminishing. Uh, so you see that you know across the board with a lot of different things. Um, so on the surface, it looks like you know maybe their income has increased, but so many things in um, India function by the gift culture. So there's a lot of you know an invisible web of of relationships, care, sharing, uh, mutual aid, uh, hospitality, um, service, which actually once it starts being commodified into money. Um, it's actually, you know, quite expensive and all of a sudden people can't afford it, you know, like, so there'd be things like, you know, um, if you go to, if someone gets, if you get sick, for example, you know, a whole group of friends, family will come and the, stay in the hospital with you, care for you, bring food every day for you there, and so that's not like at all commodified. All right now, but then as soon as you shift to a you know professionalized system where you have to start paying, then uh, you start to be in a situation of scarcity. You know that you need so much money all of a sudden and it's yeah. not around. So, so it looks like income is there, but the actually cost of things have also gone up. So your actually real amount, real economic power is decreasing in that process. Do you so. feel that? People in India are starting to become aware of, of the problem. Taking care of each other and taking care of guests started to diminish. And now it's actually gotten to the point where there's a lot of, you know, um, there's a particularly like there's a study abroad programs where they fund uh, uh, students and then they pay for their homestays. So the whole idea of homestay has become very distorting in terms of, you know, how, how people see the community and relate to, to guests and things. So that was one, one kind of example where we've seen like a flow of funds coming in and then starting to distort community relationships and things. Um, another thing um, which is around, um, uh, we've seen a lot also the flow of money, um, uh, donors funding government and NGOs, they tied up with Monsanto company uh, and um, to, uh, start to push free seeds into the community. So traditions again around seed saving and seed seed sharing have started to diminish. Where you know all this um, right now they are giving free corn seeds, free um, soya bean seeds, free beet, um, uh, genetically modified cotton seeds were being handed out, and so. Um, Again, the, the, the relationships between people around mutual care and helping each other in their fields and things have started to shift because of all this, again, flow of money into the community where people think, well, I'm getting this much money, so why should I help my neighbor out? Um, why should I share seeds with them? And also the entire our seed security is being put at risk because of all this money coming in and people then thinking, well, I'm getting these free seeds, so why should I take time to store my own seeds and things? So. You know, within a few years, indigenous varieties of seeds are disappearing quite quickly. And um, this money that's flowing in, how uh, how much is it meeting the needs of the community? Um, so it's it is. I mean, in some type, uh, you can see a short. My name is Manish Jain. I live in Rajasthan, India, and I um, work with a people's movement there called Shikshantar. And our work is on um, restoring uh, and regenerating uh, different spaces of learning, different kinds of knowledge systems, different kinds of ways of 
uh, holistic living in India. And maybe I'll just start with some things which are on my mind, where we've seen it on our, at the level of our community, where different kinds of funding has um, played an impact or distorted different kinds of relationships. Um, so one is like in India, we have um, <coughs> Tradition when um, there are there are guests um, for something like a wedding or some kind of gathering, um, what would happen is people would open up their homes. So if I was having a gathering, people coming from around India for my for my event, I would ask different friends, "Can you open up your home and people could stay with you?" Um, so it was a wave of kind of um, saving money, but also interweaving community. Um, People would stay there for two, three, four days, and um, they would, um, you know, be able to build relationships. So we actually drew from that principle, and when we started having visitors from abroad, from all over India as well, come to Udaipur, we'd ask them, "Can you stay with?" You know, I'd, we'd ask friends, "Can they stay with you?" Kind of a, it's an old version of couch surfing, right? Um, and what happened is when there's different kind of donors started coming into our community, um, they started paying people to stay at their houses. So this whole kind of relationship and thought around hospitality shifted radically, where then people started thinking, well, if we have those people come, they're paying us so much more money. So the traditions that we had around, you know, take... Or are they, uh, for the most part, still Kind of believing in this, you know, I'm going to I think most this. NGOs are actually quite stuck in it because once you get, you know, you build up, a, what happens is again, if you get a lot of money, you start to build up your organizational infrastructure, your costs grow. So actually, what shifts then is not your focus or depth around your work. It actually, you need to start getting continuous rounds of money to just support the basic infrastructure. So a lot of people get stuck in that trap. Um, there is, a, I think, I mean, there are different kinds of people's movements which are questioning this. Um, you know, there's um, uh, several times a kind of ban the World Bank, uh, kick out the World Bank kind of movements are there, which would say we don't need funds and debt from, from the World Bank. But um, for the most part, I think the people are like, um, because you, unless you're sensitive to the gift culture, and the possibilities that are within communities and how they're actually caring for each other. Um, one thinks that one is doing good by bringing in all this money. And the problem is obviously with the indicators we have also, which also show like, you know, as you destroy local localization, local economy and local e ecology and local culture, you see some growth of your, you know, economic growth is showing it that it's going up. So there's a illusion that things are improving in that process. Um, you want to tell me uh, what is what is the gift what is the gift economy? You want to tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. So there's um, um, so we we think of it as a culture, right? Um, it's a whole tradition of things which um, have been kept sacred uh, in the sense they've not been they've been prevented from being commodified traditionally. Uh, for example, f food, water, uh, nature, all of these things, uh, even, uh, you know, love, human relationships, care. So this was actually functioning in a different domain uh, um, traditionally in India. Like, so we have a tradition um, which, is, which has shifted quite a bit um, with, uh, with, you know, bottled water. But traditionally, you would, people would actually set up uh, little stalls outside of their house and have you know, pots of water for visitors. Any visitor who was passing by, any weary traveler, could stop there, sit, have some water. They wouldn't pay for it. And it would be seen as a great, you know, blessing if somebody stopped at your place. And, and it, you know, it was, it was a very spiritual gesture to be able to give somebody water. So that has shifted, for example. Actually, my, my first uh, encounter with all of this was with, with spiritual healers. Uh, traditional people working with medicinal plants and different kinds of alternative healing. And so when I went and met them, um, you know, they, they had long lines of people who are coming to them and, you know, being treated by them. And I noticed that they didn't charge money for what they were doing. Um, so, you know, you could leave if you felt like it. Uh, you could leave uh, some grains or some 
uh, a chicken or, you know, uh, if you didn't have anything, you didn't have, there was no expectation that you had to leave something. Um, so I asked them, you know, you're, you're, you have a, per, you know, presumably a good business here. There's like a lot of people coming, they found your treatment effective. So why don't you charge some money? You know, you can, uh, uh, this was many years ago. So this whole social entrepreneurship mentality of like converting things and making money out of them uh, when trying to do social good was still, you know, part of my mindset. So it's like, you know, this is a great thing. You can scale this up, earn a lot of profit from this and, you know, share that back. So they responded, you know, there are some things very sacred. Um, if we started charging for this, this is, a, this is a gift we've been re received from the divine. If we started charging for this, we'd lose all our powers and all of these things would disappear. So that started me thinking that there are so many things in our society which are in that.